We're joined on NCAD Knowledge by Peter Schwartz. Uh, you're a futurist um, and uh, business strategist. You've been speaking in Singapore about some of the emerging strategic issues that uh, you think are important. Um, what do you think are the key issues at the moment that people should be looking out for? Well, you know, uh, there are things that are very much on today's agenda that, you know, I don't need to warn people about, whether the financial crisis and all those sorts of things. But there are things that people aren't yet paying attention to that they probably should be. So let me give you a couple of examples that I think are actually quite significant. I mentioned the financial crisis. Well, first of all, it's not over. There are likely to be further uh, major moments of financial distress uh, and consequences that flow from that for the world economy, for world trade, and for Singapore most particularly. So uh, I think that's number one. I don't need to say very much about that because a lot has been said about that. But let me mention two others that are uh, probably not yet on people's radars in any way. First, a uh, food price crisis. Uh, and that is that we face a high likelihood sometime in the next few years of a dramatic increase in food prices, not because of a shortage. It isn't that the world can't produce enough food, but because of the nature of the evolution of commodity markets. We've seen already in oil markets the same kind of phenomena. We saw it in the 70s, and we just saw it last summer. And that is when the, the, uh, the buffer between supply and demand gets too narrow, what you get is significant price movements. And what happens is actually small perturbations in demand or supply produce large swings at the margin. In addition, the new factor is large-scale speculation in commodities. And by, there's always been some speculation, but what has changed is scale. That is that we have literally hundreds of billions of dollars now being exposed. So for example, last year when the oil prices ran up and they were headed up from about $70 and ended up at close to 150 about half of that, somewhere close to say the movement from 70 to 100 or so, was normal movement in the market driven by the tightness of supply and demand. But beyond that, say the next $50 or so, was mostly large-scale speculation by hedge funds. And the amount was close to $800 billion, so huge amounts of money. Why did the price fall? That money came back out when it was perceived that the market was topping. So literally, $800 billion came out, the price collapsed back to $30. That's the kind of dynamic that we're likely to see in food markets. So as the supply gets tight, we're going to see a beginning of a run up in price, and then the commodity speculator hedge funds come in and drive the price way up from there. Now, for example, rice is a prime candidate to be uh, driven up in that respect. So this part of the world, actually most of Asia, which lives on rice, is likely to see at some point in the next couple of years a dramatic increase in the price of rice. And maybe other commodities, meat, uh, other fruits, grains, etc. So the implication of that is where today typically people spend anywhere between 15 and 25 percent of their income for food, it could go as high as 40 or 50 percent. The implication of that, of course, is profound for the economies of the countries that will be affected, especially big food importing countries like Singapore. So that's one. There's a high probability of a major increase that won't last because it's not an absolute shortage of food. It's a structure of market problem. And what we'll see is a dramatic increase and then some period thereafter a dramatic fall. But in the meanwhile, people will be having to displace other consumption with food. So they won't take vacations, they won't buy consumer goods, all the kinds of things that, say, a quarter of their income might have gone to. So that's number one on my list. Another one, uh, an opportunity, and, but also a challenge, I think, is the uh, result of the, uh, the internet and the dramatic uh, fall in distribution costs of all digital goods. Uh, I mean, I think it's going to be an issue for a school like yours. You know, basically, uh, people can get your courses and other uh, information and distribute them for free. Um, uh, this interview will be on your website. Uh, somebody can get a copy of that and distribute it, and I'll make nothing, you'll make nothing, nobody makes anything on this, right? Well, that's the issue. We've seen it now in first the music business. Essentially, the old music industry collapsed as the ability to distribute music uh, was transformed. The first CD costs a lot. The second digital copy costs zero, and the distribution costs are zero. So uh, that's the new paradigm of uh, production and distribution. But it's not the paradigm of economics. 
How do you make any money out of that? Well, there's an excellent new book by my friend uh, Chris Anderson, uh, the editor-in-chief of Wired, called Free, uh, not surprisingly. And it's making the point that uh, what we are going to see is in more and more digital goods, a model where, in effect, you give away something and then you have to provide services on top of that. I mean, one of the best historic examples, of course, was uh, MS-DOS. You know, basically, Bill Gates gave it to IBM. It got uh, standardized that way. And then he could sell updates and uh, better versions to other people later on. But his, he understood that getting it standardized, widely distributed, was a platform on which he could provide other goods and services. And that kind of model of using a free good as a platform for building economics of another sort is critically important to a country like Singapore, which is more and more moving to a world of digital goods. And more and more of our economy is based in digital goods. Now, the, we're going to see every major uh, publication and knowledge industry that is already at work being transformed. First it was music, now it's television and movies, every form of print, newspapers, magazines, publishing education, courseware, all of that sort of thing is going to ha have the same kinds of issues. So this is a radical transformation of at least a big segment uh, of the economy. And I think, again, people aren't seeing the broad implication of what we've already seen in, say, the music and the newspaper business. So that's a, a, a another one that I think is actually quite profound. Now, these are the major trends that you're seeing at the present. Uh, you also talked about uh, climate change. Yes. Um, you also brought up a large number of issues that uh, could potentially um, have a major impact, such as Korean reunification. Right. How difficult is it then to um, predict what is coming up and, and to plan for that? Well, first of all, we don't predict. Okay, so uh, our goal is to do scenarios and look at the uncertainties and the elements that could surprise us. So uh, the, the, the one I mentioned, free, is already underway. Uh, we're not predicting a food price crisis, but that we are vulnerable to it. Korea is a perfect example. Uh, I believe it's a very plausible scenario that somewhere in the near future, particularly because the current leadership is going to die fairly soon and there's going to be another leadership transition, that you could see in that moment uh, a fundamental collapse of the North Korean regime and a uh, reunification of Korea, not by design or intent, but by circumstance. Um, and that would create a whole new economic and political power uh, in Asia that simply, you know, the, the two Koreas are much weaker than a single United Korea would be eventually. So that, that transforms that as an example. Uh, climate change. This is a huge issue for uh, Asia uh, because, of course, the, the big issue here is hydrocarbons, uh, and Asia runs on hydrocarbons. In Singapore, it's almost all natural gases for its electricity. China, it's all coal, some natural gas, the beginning of nuclear power and so on. So the in India, heavily coal-based. Most of the region, heavily hydrocarbon-based. And we're going to have to radically reduce the amount of hydrocarbon emissions from our energy production. Which leads then to one of the other surprises we talked about, portable nuclear power. Uh, and that is that, uh, in fact, uh, the Russians today are already uh, building and uh, offering for sale small-scale nuclear power plants. Think the kinds of things that are on nuclear submarines. So these are not 1,000 megawatt plants, these are 35 megawatt plants. And they're putting them on barges and taking them up, uh, up to the Arctic to provide power now during the extended Arctic summer. They're going to start selling those. The United States has two designs uh, that are like that, uh, roughly 10 megawatts each. So a country like Singapore that would never consider uh, nuclear power because it's too small, how do you build adequate buffers and so on, could end up going nuclear with floating nuclear power plants on barges offshore to radically reduce its hydrocarbons, first in direct electricity production. But secondly, uh, it's entirely plausible, in fact I think it's virtually certain that Singapore will eventually go to electric vehicles. So you might have a nuclear power plant offshore providing general electricity and sufficient electricity for the electric vehicles that Singapore will be using within 20 years. What about then the, the black swan events, uh, the Asian tsunami, 9-11? You, you were saying in the talk yesterday that uh, there were signals ahead of 9-11 that it, it could have almost have been predicted. Well, you know, a very spooky thing. Uh, uh, a number of years ago, I uh, headed, or uh, part of a team, uh, co-chaired a project for the National Research Council in the United States uh, on the future of engineering. And we had several scenarios. One scenario that was based on military challenges, one on natural, uh, one on biological challenges, and one on natural disasters. 
And we said, well, you know, what natural disaster is the world really unprepared for that we might want to put on the agenda? And number one on our list was a tsunami. Because we'd done everything else, earthquakes, storms, floods, but nobody had really tackled a big tsunami in a long time. We said, that's the one we probably ought to begin to pay attention to. It was an act of imagination by asking the question, what are those things that we are not looking at? What's the hole in our thinking? And when we looked at all possible natural disasters, that was an obvious hole. So my point is that even black swans, which have little precedent, I mean, there was no reason to believe particularly that there would be another tsunami of any scale. I mean, the last one that we have any record of was actually hit Japan in the 1920s. So uh, this is, uh, it is possible to actually think about those events if one is sufficiently imaginative and asks the right questions, as opposed to trying to project trends based on the past. Is that your advice then, that people should start to think about the unthinkable? Absolutely. There's no question. Uh, in fact, look, my work actually began with a guy named Herman Kahn, uh, almost, uh, uh, let's see, the late 50s. He wrote a book called On Thermonuclear War, Thinking the Unthinkable. And that's where really that phrase came from. And quite obviously why. I mean, the idea of thinking about a nuclear war just seemed unthinkable because it would be so horrific. But he said, look, it could happen. We have to think it through. And that was the right answer to the question. Uh, and so, in fact, we today have to do the same thing. We have to think the unthinkable, things that you know we just find so uh, uh, outlandish, implausible, but highly consequential. I mean, a good example, and I mentioned this in the talk yesterday, is the idea of a big rock hitting the Earth. Uh, you know, we, we tend to dismiss that as science fiction. Well, that's you know, for the movies now it happens. I wrote a movie about that subject called Deep Impact. But having said that, uh, we actually were hit. Uh, and, you know, people think, oh, well, it's, you know, happens every few million years. No, the last one was 1907 uh, over uh, Tunguska, Siberia. And if that, it blew up at about 20,000 feet and flattened about 300 square kilometers. Well, if that had come down over Singapore, say, yesterday, there'd be no Singapore today. It would have disappeared. Uh, now, is this very likely? Well, eventually, it's virtually certain. We just don't know exactly when. Uh, but there are things we can do to anticipate, plan for, prepare deal with and maybe even prevent this from happening. So there are many things, I think, of that category, like black swans, where the, and like this event of an asteroid hitting the Earth or a comet, that we uh, tend not to think about because we put them in that category of unthinkable. But we actually do need to think about them. And you made an interesting point about the financial crisis uh, in the talk, that um, you were saying there were a lot of uh, financial institutions that were essentially in denial that they, they could have spotted what, uh, what was going on, but didn't. That's right. Look, the biggest reason we don't see these things coming is denial. That is that uh, we don't want to see it, because it implies we'd have to do something different if we took it seriously. And the financial crisis was a perfect example of that, where all the incentives for the leadership of the big banks was to keep on going. Uh, you know, there was the herd mentality, well, if we don't take that deal, if we don't fund that security and so on, somebody else will, and we'll lose market share, we'll fall behind, and my stock will fall, my board will be concerned, my shareholders, my employees who depend upon that for bonuses say, you know, what's this guy doing? He's backing off, he's not taking advantage, everybody else is racing ahead. There is that sense also of incentives. This is the game. We have to keep playing the game, keep the game going, and so on. And so there were very perverse incentives, not so much having to do with huge amounts of payouts, although that was true, but all the way in which the system works. So you don't have to look for these outrageous payouts for this to happen in many other systems. Almost every bureaucratic system is vulnerable to that kind of mentality of keep doing what you're doing until it finally crashes. You did give a, a number of pointers, guidelines, as to what people should be thinking about um, in terms of how they should be approaching issues, that uh, collaboration is important, um, embracing ambiguity, which is not always easy for policymakers. That's right. And, and, you know, the two you mentioned are important. At the top of my list is a diversity of perspectives. We are all systematically blind. We only see a limited piece of reality based on our culture, our history, our psychology, our education, and so on. We pay attention to different things. You know, if, if you're married, you know you see through a different lens than your wife, you know, and, and, and a conversation is often about how you see things differently than your wife sees things. And that's a very common personal experience. 
Well, that's reified in the rest of the world. Uh, that is uh, I, one of the reasons I'm here in Singapore is to see the world through different lenses and different eyes. And so it, to really see emerging issues and some of these big surprises, it really ha helps to have a multiplicity of perspectives, a diversity of points of view that really can collaborate and challenge each other and see things really quite differently. And people need to be curious as well. They need to kind of be thinking about things and no question. analyzing what's going well, on. Well, in fact, it's the most important hiring criteria to come to work with me, and that is ruthless curiosity. I, I, I'm always looking for people who are just hungry to know stuff. They really want to know. They read widely. They travel widely. They're always asking awkward questions. They're trying to dig deep behind events to understand what's going on. You also suggested that policymakers should be suspending disbelief, almost in the same way as in a theatre. Right. Well, the reason that people are in denial usually is that it's a sense of disbelief. Oh, that can't possibly happen. Oh, for example, if you had said this time last year that the entire investment banking industry would disappear in a single weekend, they would have said, oh, come on, you're crazy. It can't possibly happen. But of course, it did. And the, the, the challenge in a lot of these kinds of early warning programs and projects is creating that suspension of disbelief. And by that I mean, you know, we, we live in a rational world, we assume things are properly connected and the world is internally consistent and so on. But sometimes it does perverse things that we don't really think about, and the financial crisis was a good example of that. And so good techniques in this uh, realm are in part about creating for an individual decision maker, and it's often very different for each one, that process of suspending their disbelief, which happens in theater. When you have a, a great show with great acting, great lighting, great music, et cetera, you know, for an hour or so, suddenly the theater disappears and you're in Camelot or someplace else. And you know, you of course know rationally that you're really not, but emotionally and viscerally, you feel it. You feel the excitement, the joy, the sadness, the delight that is created in that. You are a participant in that moment. That's what one aims for uh, in these methods, is to create that similar sense of uh, suspension of disbelief so that you can experience an alternate reality, an alternate reality where, in fact, financial crises or uh, financial institutions are on the brink of crisis. At the start of this interview, you talked about uh, the, f the food crisis, possible food crisis. Um, what are the major challenges at the moment f for us in 2009? Well, uh, I, you know, I think that uh, I would put near the top of my list, really, uh, the two big ones uh, at the moment, which are the financial re restructuring globally and climate change. You know, uh, in, in a broader sense, the, the rise of China, and that is that the, uh, you know, there's no bigger economic event than the rise of China over the next 50 years. You know, uh, you basically go from roughly 300 million people who are reasonably well off to then 600 million people and then a billion people. As all of those people get richer and richer and richer, live better, consume more, uh, travel more, and so on, the implications of all of that for the world is historic in, in uh, character. Now that in turn is connected to the first two, e.g. The financial crisis is actually accelerating the uh, rate at which China plays an increasing role in the world because it is the single largest holder of dollar reserves. It is the biggest trading partner of the United States now. Uh, and we depend on their lending to us to buy their goods. And they, on the other hand, depend upon our markets. So the rise of China uh, is critical in that sense. And of course, the biggest issue in climate change is the United States and China and dealing with coal. So all of these three issues are ho highly interconnected. The evolution of global finance and economics, the uh, developments in climate change, and the rise of China. Peter Schwartz, thanks for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you for having me.